Welcome to this journey where we dialogue with thought and heart leaders to share their reflections on human condition and how to improve them. Today we have with us Dr. Sukrita Paul Kumar. Dr. Sukrita held the Aruna Safali chair at the Delhi University till recently. Formerly a fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla, she was an invited poet at the International Writing Program, Iowa, USA, and Hong Kong Baptist University. Honorary Faculty Dural Center at Corfu, Greece, she has been a recipient of many prestigious fellowships and residencies. Her recent collection of poems are Country Dry, Dreamcatcher, Untitled, and Poems Come Home with Hindustani translations by Gulzar. Amongst her critical books are Narrating Partition and Conversations on Modernism. Her translations include the book Mute, poems by Vishal Bhartwaj, and the novel Blind. We are in moment, if, if I may use the word, in history, uh, which I believe will be talked about uh, long after this phase uh, is survived in some manner. Um, What's coming up for you now or in the past few days or weeks uh, when you're looking at things panning out right now? Hi, Hemant. I think I've been thinking a lot about this and the whole, I mean, the whole question of history in the making. You see, this kind of a self-reflexivity about history can come in only when something big happens, you know, something that jostles your mind and not just your individual mind. It's a question of history becomes history more when it affects almost the whole world, if not your own nation, other people, masses of people. So it's a collectivity, you know, a collectivity of sorts. And that collective consciousness in one's own individual self is always quite strong by not just by way of orientations, but also by a very clear understanding of being connected with the rest of the species, if not the world and the universe in general. So I think uh, Corona, when it kind of came initially, the message came, it was obviously out there somewhere. You know, it didn't hit one immediately at the personal level. But then, yes, slowly you realize that the other reaches you deep into your subjectivity, as it were. The impersonal slowly begins to become personal because it's, it came closer and closer. And whether it is to do with our leaders or uh, you know, the politicians or whatever, there was non-acceptance of this reality for a very long time. And in fact, that was our bane because if they had taken the cue, perhaps it wouldn't have spread so much. But it takes a while for something like this to really sink in. And then when it comes to the individual consciousness, and then you see, oh my God, it's a huge phenomenon. It's macro. And yet it's so micro. You know, that's the beauty. And it touches you somewhere and all that order that you have set in for yourself, you know, a pattern of living, a discipline of living, however chaotic it might be, but if you're going to work, you're going to go at a particular time, you're going to go for meetings, you're going to have your meals at a particular time, it may get a little chaotic, but there is some pattern that one is following. And all that pattern collapses suddenly when the lockdown happens in particular, you know, when it dawns upon you that it's something far more serious and then slowly when it hits you deep down there at some level of even this, I would say subconscious, you know, and all levels of consciousnesses, as it were, they come together. And when that happens, then you are jostled. And then you realize it's, it's history in the making. Something is happening. And that entire rhythm of life is disrupted. The rhythm that we uh, like or may not like, you know, to, we, we, we may have really detested that rhythm because it may have not been, at, and it wasn't in consonance. It never was. The kind of rhythm that we had all got into in terms of um, living the kind of life that contemporary 
world demands of us. Even as a writer, you know, a writer, a poet, who is supposed to sit quietly and write. Even we were getting pulled into all kinds of programs and, uh, you know, uh, I won't say show, showmanship, but still presentation here, presentation there, outward. It was getting more externalized, you know, and much more than what one wanted. So in a way that is positive, that this jostling that happened, it got you inside. It got you to realize that something was happening. So there was a moment of order, disorder, whatever, getting reorganized. You know, one had to re first of all, decodify the life that one was leading. And then you have to find base or another rhythm for existence. And now I think many of us who've been through this lockdown for so long and particularly the privileged class you know i'm talking about the privileged class i can always in fact not remember or, and i want to remember i want to sort of keep in touch with the reality outside you know as to what is what is happening and fortunately whether it is through the television or the newspaper that we read online or whatever we get to hear and see the images of reality outside your home on the roads and it takes you to the homeless people, it takes you to poverty, it takes you what we call migrant, I hate it, but migrant labor and so on. And the travails of all that. But I find that even if you're not experiencing it outside there, the internalization, the way it is happening while being in the four walls of your house is much more. And much more anguished you feel and the arms that you suffer for it, you know, primarily because of the self, a kind of helplessness that you suffer from. So there is a lot of reordering that it is required of the way the mind works, the way the thought works, the way words are to be used. I think there's greater meaning that you begin to look for because you're actually looking for greater fundamental meanings of what existence is all about. I can go on about that because the moment you get death consciousness closer to you, and I'm also relating it now to death consciousness. If somebody out there is dying, you know today that this death, you are also closer to it now. You know, you're much closer. And this proximity to the end, the final end as it were, it makes this life very precious too. This moment becomes far more precious. You want to dig into greater meaning today, whatever that be. I, it, sometimes, sometimes it's, uh, okay, let me not define the process, but I picked up a few things that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one part of it was to with where we were, where we are, and where we want to go. And there is the patternizing or the order seeking, certainty seeking kind of uh, affinity that we have. Uh, on this particular aspect, I see that uh, in the past, just before the breakout of this virus, we had a uh, difference of opinions on where we were and where we are coming from, even from, you know, back in the history. And there are polarizing. So there is, there is something called a diversity of opinion and healthy argumentation versus polarization of opinions and, you know, weaponizing of argu argumentation, if I may use that word. So that was already happening. And then in comes this particular phenomenon and it shakes everybody. And yet we still find amplifying of both the forces, the forces of polarization and self-serving and the polar and, uh, and, and the other and the other of uh, wanting to make sense and wanting to reimagine and reintegrate sort of thing. So that is one thing that I picked up. And the second thing that I picked up was, uh, you know, it's interesting when you mentioned that uh, there, is this, there is this outwardness that we had even earlier. And even within this, there is a lot of outwardness. In some sense, we are migrating from ourselves at an individual level to outside. 
and then we're also seeing this migrating crisis the migration crisis there is some similarity i could see can you speak to that yeah i think it's a very important point that you have raised because in fact i was thinking about this myself i mean there are so many paradoxes that we have lived with even before this phenomenon obviously and also there is a continuation of that you know however it, but but i think to me is a very basic word and a position is that is the word that i used actually a phrase which is that of self reflexivity we were not reflecting so much on this phenomenon right but this is this kind of a very creative in a way i would call it a creative cause in the rhythm that had got created by the way we were leading our lives you know and i hope that a new order will be created i hope that a new world will be created after whatever we have we are experiencing now there is no saying we don't know we may become worse as as humanity i don't know but to come back to the point that you are raising about this whole question of um, uh, what i call paradoxes you know whether it is on the one hand we were say globalizing in a variety of ways on the other hand borders were getting to be more significant today again this a uh, corona thing is taking us to a borderless context you know we are looking at okay what happens in italy what is happening in the us and um, there may be some inherently some competition also going on in a very unhealthy way that uh, we don't know where the vaccine is going to come from but that vaccine may be a connecting factor eventually right it might just connect all humanity to that particular place from where it may have emerged so the pooling in of knowledge the pooling in of identification and the identification of problems and then the resolutions you know i think somewhere knowledge had also become divided you know there were borders that were getting around everything and something like this corona is connecting us all together we are as worried about from where we are going to get the solution as perhaps somebody is sitting in timbuktu you know because the whole world is getting affected by that so therefore i think um, uh, also in, in one sense you know i've always been saying that communication tools we have very sophisticated ones today right very so the way we are talking to each other you may be at whatever part of the world i'm connecting with you right but today when we are talking i guess i guess that there is a greater effort to communicate i want you to understand what you are saying you want me to understand what you are saying and my monologue has to become a dialogue for that pulling in but the shrill of monologues that we were experiencing you know all around of course more dialogues have been happening that is why knowledge moves forward etc etc but this kind of a shocking event the way it has happened and the way we are shaken out of our skins as it were you know it becomes important for us to see the value of these connections you know the value is today different i I'm trying to recall who is it I think it was Raymond Williams who had talked about a structure of feeling you know and this rebuilding of a structure of feeling or restructuring of feeling also is dependent on what in the present day world in the present day living what are the values that we cherish and one of the values would be honest sharing isn't it honest sharing of knowledge honest sharing and pooling of experience and only then humanity would survive probably when there is a threat of extinction of humanity there would be a coming together right and this coming together i think is extremely valuable and there's a different value you know the environmentalists have been screaming away ranting away about what's been going on and we're not connecting forget about connecting with each other we are not connecting with our surroundings we are not bothered there's indifference and what you call weaponizing you know the kind of weapons we have used to 
in a way massacre all healthy ideas you know and we have come to a point when we do not know whether the nuclear bomb any time you know can be blown by anyone who is an eccentric or a mad person or whatever so all that progress seems to have come to a negative end right and it, and i say an end because this was the point when we could have experienced a total deliberate annihilation of one country or the other or maybe the whole world or whatever so now i think this is the time to pause and save ourselves from that extinction whether it comes to a weapon or it comes to the way of life that we had led ourselves to so in one sense you know i think um this migration that you are talking about you know it's very really interesting that you use the word migration because on the one hand we are talking about stay home right staying at home is beautiful and in the homes i find some people not everybody is saying oh let's take in our journeys let's reflect but there are people who are feeling lonely at home you know because we got used to the paradigm shift needing to happen we got used to the whole idea of uh, feeling at home in exile as it were you know living out of a suitcase i'm talking about our class of people right but obviously even if you go to the other class of people you know those who are homeless literally homeless and and are on the roads what kind of home are they going back to they know that there may not even be four walls there but it's more to do with connection it's more to do with emotional connect <clears throat> you know just the idea of going back not just to family but that land to which the person belongs they don't mind many of them you know have i've heard on the news and everywhere how they say we don't care rather than dying of corona we would rather you know go and die of starvation at home we don't care because to them that value of emotion value of that connection so isn't there a paradigm shift that is happening across class across caste gender everything across community so i think there are things that new things that are coming up which are very valuable and those well we have to learn to hold on to them because my fear is that we might again slip you know we may slip into again the same old way of life and paradigms that were so unhealthy but my sense it is that greater uh, sanity will pre- prevail uh, as a kind of in opposition to the madness that uh, we experienced we were experiencing yeah uh, it's interesting uh, sometime back i was uh, having an interaction with uh, dr luke ken and luke is a researcher at cambridge he is basically an existential risk researcher mm-hmm. and they have been studying civilizational collapses in history oh. and they've looked at various reasons for not only the reasons but also the symptoms of a collapse mm. and uh, one of the symptoms of the collapse is uh, breaking down of whatever order that was created a precipitous fall in that order and the loss of state whatever form the state would be uh, and you know the, the state losing its monopoly over power Hmm. uh in some sense now why this uh, why this important why this is important is when i was discussing with luke he believe that uh, he calls corona as not so much of a goldilock shock now the word goldilock shock is you know there are certain there are certain phenomenon in in the world the coming of the coming together of which is ensuring that the human life form can exist and if you take those things away this goldilock principle cannot survive and the human being cannot survive and his point was that corona while it is affecting people everybody because of the lockdown but uh, somehow somehow he feels he fears that we will still get into the same road soon or we are not going inward as you said uh, we're not going that much inward right now so that's one point that i wanted to bring up there's another interesting point that you brought up which was to do with uh, 
uh, rationality being social in some form or knowledge being social in some form where no single person can today claim of having knowledge of absolutely everything that is happening in the world and even the evolving phenomena that we are a part of which means there is a coming together of various disciplines and i i i i believe you love the word integrative discipline to be able to make sense from their different angle to understand what we are a part of right now the challenge there again we see is across the across the government the policy makers and across the social media we again see difference of opinion and the difference of opinion is okay so far as it is diversity but it's in it's in a very toxic environment that it's being exchanged uh, i wonder if you could speak something to that i think you are saying something which is very very again very significant because um, i have been involved in the project of uh, i would say education and knowledge construction you know at the higher in a higher education in particular in the university and i have been basically saying this forever i think i'm talking about the integrative approach and i'm talking about how you know the <clears throat> significance of particularly literature and that's very close to my heart what i'm going to say because literature actually does mean that uh, it is inclusive of history and sociology and humanities in general and also fantasy and science fiction and you know and we know today we are going referring to camus uh, texts and you know the plague and we are talking about all the texts that were written long time ago and i am very fond of even referring to samuel beckett and um, and i i always always feel that uh, you know when crises of this kind happen corona kinds uh, it is here that perhaps this is godo for us you know it is godo has come now it doesn't mean that godo has always been and i've talked that text and i realize that uh, it can mean anything it can be the end or it can mean redemption you know it can also mean redemption and that's another paradox you know redemption meaning redeeming of all the kinds of stuff that was going on earlier and we are coming out of it to see something new right and it's a resurgence of that creative innovative self a human being i hope we are moving towards that but as you said rightly one can be very pessimistic because that's there's the other side to it however coming back to godo and i do feel that you know um uh, uh, the way beckett envisioned life you know he envisioned that text in particular waiting for godo and it can be interpreted in a variety of ways but he's dealing with language he's dealing with communication he's talking about you know trying to reach silence and meaningful silence through words how do words cancel themselves out and the bare meaning of it stays how do we go to fundamental sounds you know which are very very primary to living rather than constructing words all all around which ultimately become cacophony right and there is a lot of genocide of language that happens in a particular way language is that happens so he is bringing in a lot of concepts which are sociologically very relevant philosophically very pertinent today and uh, i i honestly feel that some of the things that you said for instance why did the text come at the time that it did because probably at that time also at any point of time a, a, a scientific literary artistic aesthetic articulation of the crisis needs to happen right the metaphors that may be used would may be different but how do you understand that metaphor for instance the metaphor of silence that he uses you know and i am very fond of that because i do believe that we have abused words all this while into into becoming noise to a large extent how do we value silence how do we look at uh, and that's also again somewhere you know inward journey that i'm talking about so i think we have to here's another shift that i i'm suggesting and i'm suggesting this paradigm shift of how to how to use language how not to have a language and yet be able to speak 
right? Not stress too much on the learning of A, B, C, D, but learning of gesture, of humanity, of, um, you know, behavior, of all those patterns. So that is because we have demarcated one discipline from the other in such a way that those boundaries and walls have grown between them, you know. And we are not able to envisage our lives in totality, our own lives, individual lives, forget about relationship with the other. But in literature, you would find that is happening. How does the other become more approachable, more accessible? Because the difference is spelled out experientially. And when experientially, as, as in storytelling it happens, or in a poem it might happen that way, you know, when it comes out as a stark reality, in a way one says, okay, this fiction is lies. But you see, you begin to see the truth of that lies. Then. And that is greater truth than what you apparently feel is the truth. So I think to be able to encounter this reality, layered kind of meanings and um, feelings and all of that, and to get an access to that through humanities or literature, I think knowledge paradigms have to change. Knowledge making paradigms have to also change. Otherwise, you and I might, might sit in our drawing rooms and have these discussions, but it doesn't go across. It doesn't sort of spread. So I personally feel that, you know, uh, there are certain uh, old fashioned words that we used to, you know, uh, they have to come back when you say, oh, I'm touched, oh, I'm moved. And nowadays, if somebody says that, it's, oh, don't be sentimental, don't be emotional, we need to bring that back. We need to bring it back. Feeling has to come back. And to go back to that whole idea of structure of feeling, new structure of feeling has to be developed today. We are not hardened robotic people. We shouldn't be, but we are getting on to be becoming that. So I don't know what we started with, but I've gone on in this fashion. Go, go ahead with whatever else. That's interesting. Uh, I want to tie it back to uh, the first segment that we were discussing, where you brought on the uh, the interesting uh, phenomena of death mm. and the death consciousness. Mm -hmm. And in some way, now tying it back to silence, uh, because eventually we will be, mm -hmm. uh, whether we want it or not, mm -hmm. we won't be silenced mm -hmm. if we don't silence ourselves. Um, you mentioned a point of, uh, of honest sharing in the conversation. So I'm just trying to see if there is something here in terms of the conversations around death, the, the staying with the idea of death and imagining it and understanding it, what does it really mean? Mm -hmm. And then hence, hence, what does life mean? You know, deriving life out of death in some way. Uh, yeah, I think these are... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I was also saying that, you know, see, all of us say, okay, death is inevitable. We all say that. And then we pass on to something else, right? But as I was saying, the, the, the whole idea of death getting to be closer and closer, right? Not just with age or illness, but the way it is today. Corona, anytime it can hit me, and uh, I am conscious of that, you know. So therefore, there is this tremendous desire, and I, in fact, wrote a paper on this, which is um, uh, in the. In, it's a paper called "The Becoming of Literature," but it's really talking about creativity amidst crisis, you know. So if there is a crisis of the kind that we are going through right now, which is personally hitting us in our subjectivities, I think there is at a core somewhere that whole idea that life will end, that inevitability that I talked about is actually real. You also begin to see it as a loss of possibilities. And I think that's where 
I want to hook on a little bit, right? The loss of possibilities. And that is why if there is a younger person around who, who uh, meets death and uh, you grieve more, much more, you know, you grieve a lot because you feel, my God, what could he have done? You know, there are endless number of possibilities. And uh, there is a sudden cessation of all that. It's very difficult to swallow that. And so I think it's very important to retain the capacity to dream. And one of the things that can happen with this kind of crisis is loss of dreams, you know. You might say, but you know, the loss of future is the end of future. And that can be horrible. Because the moment you use the word possibilities, you are actually looking at future, right? You're making a future. But in that making of the future, you, you have to have a lot of energy invested in that. Today, you cannot do that. So it is in the now that you have to put in all your energy and all your thought and all your emotion. And that's where I think this death consciousness, uh, I would like to call it death consciousness, which actually resulted in, uh, after the world wars, it resulted in the modernist movement in a very big way, you know, in the West. And a lot of art forms came up and surrealism and impressionism and lots of new things started to happen. Because then you have to find new words, new forms of articulation, new avenues of thought, new, I mean, what I was in a nutshell saying, you have to recodify yourself and the expression. And you have to understand what freedom is all about. You've been talking about wanting freedom. You have all the freedom in the mind, don't you? But how do you, but your orientations are very strong. And I think one of the things that happens in the process of our growing up and edu so-called education and everything is that we are loaded and burdened with um, uh, orientations, right? And we are trapped in that. So it's liberation from those orientations that Corona can do for you. Get out of it, you know. And when you do, you, you don't even realize when you do, that's when you start either painting, writing, doing something new, innovating, whatever your medium of expression is, you know. It could be, I, I've even seen whether it's in the Facebook or on the phones, some people, men who are cooking at home and they find new recipes, you know, and then they're sort of going gaga over that because there's something new that has happened, you know. So uh, <coughs> it's very interesting to see how these orientations the trap of orientations, you know, the burden of orientations can be rid of in this kind of a state of mind. So to me, that is also valuable, unless, of course, it becomes destructive. A wise person becomes foolish, which is wonderful. I think too much wisdom can also kill one, you know. So any, anything that is burdensome in the mind, this, this can, one can be liberated from it. And also mm -hmm. some values of compassion can come in, you know. Some yeah. values of compassion can definitely creep into the mind. And I've seen, for instance, you know, very, uh, one of the people who comes to my, well, used to come and now is talking on the phone. He's found a language of compassion today. And he never used to talk in that fashion. But today he's connecting up with people and he's, he's actually gone taking the risk uh, and taken food to the uh, labor who's uh, walking away. So what has happened to him suddenly? He's suddenly free of all the ties that the kind of living that we were we had. He's free of all that. And he's not, he doesn't have to go to his office or whatever. And suddenly he's feeling free in the mind as well. And now he's looking at that class of people to which he was never connected. So God knows, you know, what good can happen through that. Would you like me to read a poem? I would like to read a little poem yeah, that I did please, recently. Please, please go ahead. I have to tell you a little bit about this because these were dialogues that I was having, very innocently romantic dialogues with the river Ganga. Romantic in the sense, you know, I was sitting by the side of the river and the flow, beautiful green, blue, grey, depending on what time of the uh, day you are, are sort of relating to it with. And it was a different kind of a phenomenon, this writing of the dialogues with Ganga. 
so it moved it came from that beautiful cynic um, value getting articulated in poetry and then that was when i was there in dehradun and closer to the river and so on but these dialogues continue to happen with me till they are i'm still writing many of them and now i'm talking to ganga about corona you know because i cannot avoid it i just cannot it's there it's all around it is within me and now even my words that i use would have to do with it right something or the other so um i i, I can't read more than i will read only two these are small pieces like maybe 10 lines and then another 10 lines and um uh, i'm talking to ganga so here you are and i say you know what oh ganga i always knew even before i was born that one day i'd dive into you with my heavy baggage of names labels theories formulae definitions and then ganga soaked in moonlight i emerged on the other side of you I wanted to be redeemed of my lord to begin life all over again. That's one wonderful, wonderful. The second one: the world is coming to an end, O Ganga, not with an atom or nuclear bomb, nor with an earthquake or floods, not with a sudden jolt. but as a gradual spread first of fear then of asphyxiation the war with the deadly virus has begun see if you have a solution no ganga give us signs for the survival of the species or do you do wish for our extinction just to breathe a fresh yes we get it the flow of life must continue not choke and <laughs> uh, there are quite a few that i have recorded that you can see even the metaphors change and the words are different and uh, it's an angst that i'm sharing ganga is a friend after all <laughs> <laughs> nice um just trying to connect to uh, you mentioned just before the reading of these wonderful poem the um that there are these possibilities and suddenly one faces the shortening of them or the or the extinction of them when faced with the fear of death or the death itself uh the challenge the challenge is that while there are these possibilities and one chases so okay let me just rephrase there's this interesting paradox that we want things now but we are not able to savor when we get them in the now because we want more and the next and because we believe that there is a possibility of more and possibility of next and suddenly there is this there is this you know migration again i would like to bring that word where we there we wanting something and we don't savor it when it comes to us and we want something else that we believe is a possibility and we just keep keep going in the hamster <laughs> in the hamster wheel <laughs> over a period of time uh, anything that comes up for you i mean i think there's a um you know um it is said that habit is a dead nerve right it is a dead nerve and unfortunately um we are in that on that wheel most of the time and taking circles and uh, uh, one of the key things that comes to my mind is that on the one hand one does feel okay let me do whatever i can now because it's very important you know there is probably no tomorrow so i better do it now but on the other hand the other thing that comes is which is just the opposite of this which is you put ha- your hand on the other hand and you say nothing to be done what can i do right i'm helpless it's an exasperation 
not coming out of, I mean, you have all the energy, you, you can do lots, but for what use is this energy? After all, one is only passing time from the point of being born to death. How do you fill it up is not my concern because I'm going to die anyway. So these are the two sides. And so while we are saying that death consciousness, etc., can make you very existentially conscious and aware and put you at work in the way that you want to because you're committing to the moment. And this commitment to the moment is very significant for any action, meaningful action. On the one hand, it is that, and the paradox is that, oh, what use is that anyway, right? And again, I'm referring to, uh, it's very interesting because Beckett comes again to my mind, and he has this lovely speech that he has given, it's a tirade, and he has given it to a character called Lucky in Waiting for Godot. And in this tirade, he's kind of wasting and pining all the time, right? But it's a tirade to, to in, a, in a way, it's kind of ranting away of how one is wasting and pining, you know. But again, I, I've always felt that, you know, why he's doing that, that in itself is a sign of life. Because if you become conscious, if you, if you, were, if you become a very sensitive witness of your action, you know, in itself, it throws up something new. Your ranting is, an, is a kind of a catharsis, right? And in that cathartic moment, something is happening which is making place for the new. You become conscious that you're wasting and you're pining, and then therefore you do something, right? So I always see this juxtaposition, and um, I also feel that, you know, this intense thoughtfulness is not the same as mindfulness. And I think that's very important. Somewhere if we intellectualize everything too much in terms of thought, you know, and the sequencing of the thought we try to keep in mind, it becomes very convincing for the other and for one's own self in the creation of that thought process. But it also is suicidal to be doing that because then you're not connecting with, with its being, the being of thought. And that again, my favorite word, integration. If that integration doesn't happen with emotion and passion, then it's not going to lead us anywhere. I don't know what the psychologists will say about it, but experientially that's what I feel, particularly in the moments of my creative uh, writing or even in my painting. When I'm sitting down to paint anything, I cannot just put my thought on the page, on the canvas. I cannot do that. If I just make it very crafty because the craft has to be worked out, and it will become crafty, right? And, and if the craft begins to show so much without the passion with which that experience is getting projected, then it's a very lopsided projection. So what, what I feel is, again, if, you, if I connect this experience with the experience of what is going on in Corona times, as I call it, I think this is precisely what happens. You cannot isolate thought of emotion. They come together because the passion comes along with what you're thinking. And therefore, I think these are the moments of creative thinking. Whether it is in the idea of how to make a vaccination, you know, or how to make a poem. It could be either, or even how to cook a certain dish. That particular certain kind of creativity and the energy required for it, and the commitment to the moment, you know, it speaks up for everything. And creativity takes shape in a variety of ways then. And then it is received in different ways. It may not be a certain idea that you are trying to project, may get it to a totally different idea in another person's mind. The reception of it is very different. So it's a beautiful process in the process of living. Actually, I'm talking about the process of living. And one is kind of awakened to that living. 
if you are not working out the logistics of what time you have to go where and how to go and what about the traffic and what all of that is put aside and that's on the superficial plane but something else is also happening as i said you are uh, all the orientations are gone something new is happening in the mind you know yeah. and then you find new avenues for yourself in fact this ties in well with uh, the thing that you were saying a little earlier about creativity in crisis and i wonder how you would speak to the next thing that i'm saying we make things now these things could be anything could be a recipe could be a, could be a poem could be things so we make and then either we show or we share the challenge that i see and maybe it's my perception right now is that we are a lot around making for showing rather than making for sharing yeah yeah i think that's a very vital difference and if it is for showing and um, it becomes a kind of a performance you know uh, performance by itself i'm not denigrating theater or all that you know or singing or whatever else but even there if you find you know if uh, an actor's uh, acting becomes too obvious it's it becomes a show he's not a good actor why i mean if i want to pay a tribute to irfan for instance irfan khan because his acting doesn't show at all he's acting like an art you know he's owning the other character totally and gets to become that character and somewhere in fun mixes with that and that character also modifies you know itself and the whole world shares that experience it reaches out to everyone because it is so naturalized and the process of owning happens if you own an experience totally through your commitment to that experience if that owning is 100% really 100% then i think you're not going to be really show then it's going to be sharing and your desire it would be then as an artist as a scientist to really to really connect connect with the others it's just like you know when a child goes through an experience and comes and pulls at the you know skirt of the mother and says hey listen listen you know i go through this and you become innocent yeah in that innocence Amazing. That kind of innocence, Amazing. that's so beautiful, you know. And that innocence has also got something to do with the sense of wonder you experience when you are creating, you know, when you are in the in the moment of creation. It is so beautiful because when you say, "Oh my God, is this possible? Yeah, you know, how how am I right at this word? Or how how is this color useful here?" in itself that sense of wonder is going to make the art good you know because then that wonder has to be translated into something some it has to acquire a form a shape and that it requires a certain kind of an imagination you know and i think this imagination also can become very stale over time and so these moments again the moments of the kind that we are in it can get you out of that staleness and you look for need to have a patience for it sometimes you have to wait for those moments to come when you'll get fresh expression fresh ways of communication fresh shapes will come up and the structure of feeling will change right whether in the, in the making of it or in the communication of it you don't have to work hard like you have to work hard but not only at the idea of showing that shift i think you have put your finger on in a wonderful way it's it's wonderful and in fact another distinction that uh, came up for me when you were sharing this is um uh, that in the process of creation you reach an experience wonder that you've created this so in some sense you you uh surprise your own self yeah and you then are in awe of your own self in some nice way sometimes and not very nice which is narcissistic <laughs> i was getting at that so yeah so i think the distinction the distinction of 
awe of oneself, uh, not turning narcissistic, and sharing and not showing is extremely important. Is what I feel. Yeah, I think it's also very important. You know, you use the right, uh, you know, word narcissism, because it's also an indulgence. Then you know, and it's a vulgarity of a sort, indulgence in that particular way. But I think um, that's why uh, an artist somewhere has to uh, learn and remember to remain humble. If you acquire that arrogance, and that's why I don't know, it's a mystery. The creative process is a mystery. And many a time, if you feel that your poem is complete or your art, whatever you're producing is complete, and you step back and you, you've enjoyed the process, and you step back and you also wonder, is that me who created it? How did it happen? Who told me this is the end? And if you go into the creative process, you do realize that in the moment of creation, it's another level of consciousness that you get into. It's a different domain altogether. But, and then you might lose that. You might lose it. It's not at any moment you can sit and sit down and write. You can't. But what are you waiting for? What is this whole thing about inspiration? You know, you do need that. Even if you think it's old fashioned, you do need it. You feel stimulated. You feel committed to it. You start doing something. And then it goes. Even if you work all day, all night, you're not going to be able to write. You're not going to be able to paint. You're not, able to, 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 you're not going to be able to sculpt or anything artistic. You know, it's even like how in a relationship, if you're not inspired enough to reach out to the other person, it's going to be very dumb doing it, you know. And your partner is going to tell you, oh my God, what are you trying to do? You're not feeling it really, you know. So it comes, you come across that. But when it happens uh, in, in, in an inspired way, with passion, with also the effort, passion, empty passion doesn't work, you know. But the effort goes along with it. And when that happens, then you become a medium for that creativity. You are just like a medium. Allow yourself to go, let go in that, you know. And then you later on, if you become arrogant, you may not ever get it also, you know. <laughs> that arrogance, you know, you might have got the craft, but that arrogance becomes very dominating. And I think it is at the cost of, finally, it is at the cost of your creativity. Interesting, interesting. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned during uh, when you were sharing is the idea of in integrating and you you brought very interestingly somewhere the conversation of meaning uh, and you know death and meaning and, and integration I, I believe and this is what I feel and I, I want to uh, hear your thoughts around it that we have these streams of experiences and then they are they are of varied kinds and you know uh, they invoke different kinds of feelings and then we try to make sense of them compress them to make sense of it in some way uh, but sometimes we oversimplify the sense making because we are not able to hold the paradoxes and the dissonances and sometimes it becomes too overwhelming the whole process of integration because we are not centered and we don't know how to contain these variations. And then in, while doing it in life, we, we keep doing it over a period of time and we want to arrive at meanings. We want to be meaningful. Uh, and then we're searching for it in, in various forms, in various outside validations or approvals or doing things um, anything that comes up for you for this yeah i i think uh, i am very keen on not stress not stressing on uh, meaning too much because i think in our search for meaning all the time if you're if you're obsessive about that then it becomes very reductive of the experience right because in fact it's very difficult uh, to 
I think I think language is inadequate to capture the experience as it is. It is totally inadequate, and we have to realize that. And and yet we are looking at where meaning lies, but mean, meaning in a larger sense. It should be inclusive of the experience in such a way that the unsaid is echoed in the said. You know what I mean? Because what you are saying in terms of what the meaning is, we, there is a lot of abstract, abstract experience behind it, which has not been captured in your articulation of meaning. But in the articulation, if it is, if you have that power of communication or power over, there is a magic to words, no? And if you are able to capture that in such a way that the ambivalences are also captured. The idea is to somewhere become more suggestive of it, suggestive of complexity, because it cannot be captured totally. That is why we people in literature, we use metaphors, we use abstractions, we use them not because we, uh, we don't have maybe vocabulary, maybe we have too much of vocabulary and that can become a problem, you know? Yeah. Too much of vocabulary can become a problem. But we should realize that the word has, Sartre had to say a lot about this. He has a whole book called Words, Jean-Paul Sartre. And he talks about the inadequacy of the usage of those words, you know, as much as he uses the idea of how they should become adequate, you know. But for them to become adequate, they have to be inclusive of the abstract meaning. Very beautiful. Yeah. So I think that is that is a journey which um, even in ordinary communication we have to undertake. How to make my monologue become a dialogue as I said, you know. It will become a dialogue only if I am able to have the right pauses, the right silences. The silences that I'm talking about are inbuilt in the noise that I'm creating by using these words. You know. So it is, one has to have therefore the art of listening as much as the art of articulation for a dialogue to happen. Beautiful, beautiful man. Mm -hmm. um, I would urge us to come back at some, at some point uh, mm -hmm. soon and continue with this as a second episode mm -hmm. and uh, unless you want to bring up something and want to discuss right now no I think it's fine it's fine unless you want me to finish with a poem which I always do yes yes, yes. so I do that <laughs> yes. and um, I uh, you know um, feel that what I was saying just now it's a small poem and I must tell you that this came up only because my publisher was insisting that I should write a preface to my poems, to the book. And I don't like to do that. But so I said, okay, I'll, I'll write another poem which can become a preface, you know. <laughs> this is a preface. And I'm calling it of creative anxieties. Wow. In the process of writing, I am ahead of myself always and there's no looking back the rest of the time i am stalking myself and there is no looking ahead the issue is that of keeping pace that's my preface <laughs> as an epilogue to our conversation <laughs> i think it's I think let's end this with silence. <laughs> it's <Thank you>. beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Eman, for taking me along with this. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your insights. And, you know, we, we wish we'll come back again and have more discussion. Mm -hmm.